following in these talks the appearance in Iran of a uh, class of people who were prosperous, who were Muslims, initially primarily Arabs, but increasingly uh, Iranian converts to Islam, who were knowledgeable about Islam, who collected lore about Islam because they had the wealth and the leisure time to spend months and years traveling in search of this lore. I mean, talking about the culture that they generated. And a lot of it um, seems to me to be based on a burgeoning cotton industry that had not existed before the Arab conquests. But what I want to deal with now is what happened to this class of people. I don't believe that any other part of the Muslim uh, world at that time had anything uh, like the prosperity and the um, substance of what we saw in Iran. And yet by the 1200s, they, were, they had pretty much disappeared. And the 1100s seems to be the period of that, of that disappearance accelerating. I wrote a book called Cotton, Climate, and Camels in early Islamic Iran that in its concluding chapters attempted to explain the demise of this, uh, of this class of people, or in fact, uh, their migration out of Iran to other Muslim lands. My hypotheses in that book were based upon drawing together bits and pieces of data and uh, hints from many different types of sources. And they focused upon a notion of a change in climate. This relates to two different debates that, uh, that I think influenced my thinking. And um, one of them is still ongoing. The first of the debates goes back to when I was an undergraduate in 1961. I was a student at Harvard, and there was a visiting professor, uh, Robert Lopez from Yale, who was there for a semester, and he taught a course on medieval Italian cities. I found the course thrilling. It was one of only two or three courses I had as an undergraduate that left a huge impression on me. What I didn't realize at the time was that Professor Lopez was deeply immersed in a really tense debate in the field of the history of the Italian Renaissance. He had proposed in a uh, widely uh, discussed uh, paper that the Renaissance, uh, we're to, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, the heart of the Renaissance, took place in the midst of a depression. And this outraged most of the people in the art history field and many people in Italian history, because the notion was generally accepted. People like the Medicis were riding high on a wave of vast economic uh, resources and that the Renaissance occurred during a boom period in Italian economic history. Not so according to Professor Lopez. He said that there had been a boom period uh, in the 1200s uh, and that that boom period had caused uh, the accumulation of great amounts of money in Italy, uh, in Florence and Genoa and Pisa and uh, Venice, the major uh, cities involved in in trade, but he said that that boom had passed and that the population which had been growing had shrunk. Indeed, we know there was a shrinkage of population after 1348 when you had the Black Death. But he said that the recovery from the Black Death uh, really was not as substantial as some people had believed uh, and that you really had a contraction of economic activity in Italy that coincided with the great works of the, of the Renaissance. And part of the argument was that people invested in magnificent works of art because there wasn't much of anything else to invest in. Trade was not what it had been uh, a century before. His paper produced a tremendous backlash. And he eventually, in fact, just uh, about the time I was taking his course, uh, he eventually wrote a, uh, another paper discussing the debate and 
bringing forth even more information and pointing out that very slowly, other economic historians were coming around to the idea simply because there is a, a flash of brilliance in some aspect of society, it doesn't necessarily mean that other aspects of society are flourishing as well. I found this a very uh, interesting, compelling debate at the time, and I suppose it was in the back of my mind when I began to ponder what became of the patricians of Nishapur, of this class of prosperous, learned, religious, um, civilian elites that, um, that had grown up uh, in the 800s, the 900s, uh, substantially on the basis of a huge boom in a uh, previously unknown cotton trade. It seemed to me that really important changes took place in the 10 hundreds, and that the 10 hundreds were a turning point, and that new trends from the 10 hundreds became uh, instantiated in the 11 hundreds, and by the end of the 11 hundreds, uh, Iran's cities, many of them, had lost a great portion of the population, and you had had a migration of uh, educated, prosperous Iranians leaving the country and resettling in Anatolia, what is today Turkey, in India, uh, in the Arab lands, um, Syria and Egypt, for example, uh, and in, uh, in Central Asia. That diaspora uh, was a conclusion that I, that I came to in various ways. And I'll talk about the diaspora in my next talk uh, because it is terribly important for Iranian history today, because it is through this diaspora that the Iranian language became spread throughout uh, the area from Bengal to, uh, to Constantinople uh, in a way that Persian empires had never succeeded in spreading their linguistic culture in any prior era. So the diaspora is the target uh, here. And the diaspora is made up of primarily of civilians, not of uh, warriors, say in the case of the Arab conquest or later on in the 1200s, uh, the Mongol uh, or Turco-Mongol conquest. You had ordinary people who were, uh, who were leaving Iran. Why were they leaving Iran? I looked at other changes that seemed to take place in the 10 hundreds and I saw a conflict. I saw a tremendous amount of, of friction, um, fighting, uh, between factions uh, within the religious community, trying to understand why this fighting accelerated and became so severe. So severe, in fact, that by the 1140s, uh, the city of Nishapur, which had been over 150,000 people, um, lost perhaps 80% of the population, and most of the city was, uh, was, became uninhabitable. This was fomenting in the 10 hundreds. Now, also in the 10 hundreds, and this, of course, is terribly important. You had rise of a new uh, political formation, heavily centered on Iran, and that is the Great Seljuk uh, Dynasty, the first major Turkic, uh, Turkic dynasty in the Islamic Middle East. The Karakhanids had been a bit earlier in Central Asia, but here in Iran, Iraq, uh, you had a, a Turkish dynasty under powerful emperors like uh, Tughrobek, uh, Alp Arslan and Malik Shah, and somewhat later uh, Sanjar, the last of the uh, significant great Seljuks. There's been a great deal written on Seljuk history, not only by modern historians, but a great deal was written at the time by historians, many of them, I think, in, in the pay of one or another Seljuk sponsor. And they portray a dynasty that is uh, wealthy, that is powerful, but that comes to be riven by internal uh, family uh, discord. And the tendency of historians reading these, uh, these works in praise of the Seljuks is to say that to the degree that there was any uh, disorder, it was because of internal political intrigue and uh, competition uh, within the Seljuk family. The Seljuks began their rule in Nishapur pretty much in 1037, uh, when they uh, 
when they occupied the city, their army settled on the outskirts of the city and the city represented by its civilian elite, not by the prior governor, capitulated and said, okay, this is now a Seljuk city. And the emperor Tokrobek began to coin uh, gold coins in, in the city. So this is happening directly to the people that I have done most of my uh, research on, this religious civilian elite of Nishapur. But it applies to other cities they occupied as well, such as Isfahan and Ray, and, uh, other places in Iran. It was interesting to me that this is occurring in the 10 hundreds, because long ago, uh, the, uh, the most influential social and economic historian of 75 years ago, a French scholar named Claude Caen, had written an interesting speculative article about the 10 hundreds and why they were so disorderly all the way from Morocco to Central Asia. And he had come to no conclusions, but he had documented areas of disruption uh, throughout a very wide uh, spectrum of Muslim lands. The possibility arose that there could be here something related to a change in the climate or a change in the economic order related to a change in the climate. I had asked a uh, graduate student at one point to look through a chronicle of the city of Baghdad, the best uh, attested you know, historical center of the, uh, the pre-Mongol period, and make a list of all of the weather events uh, mentioned in, uh, in, the in the major chronicle of the Oman uh, of Ibn al -Jazi. That showed up a, a sort of cluster of miserable weather uh, descriptions, primarily in the, uh, in the early 10 hundreds. There is one really severe one a couple of decades earlier, but that has now been explained as uh, being caused by a volcanic eruption that affected uh, world uh, weather for that year. But I saw there a, a cluster that seemed to be uh, extraordinary. In pursuit of, of a possible climatic impact, I uh, encountered, of course, today's climate debate. And I find them interestingly uh, parallel. The world has never been wealthier than it is now, or more fearful of what is to come. And yet we have a substantial portion of the world's population that does not believe that there is any change in the climate, and another portion that believes that it's the most dire crisis that uh, humans have faced, um, perhaps in their history. It's unrelated to, to prosperity. And yet, when you look at projections of what could happen because of sea level rise um, and other uh, impacts of climate change, you realize that uh, prosperity uh, can be fragile. The current debate is different from a historical debate because we have so much data now and the people who believe there is a climate crisis uh, rest their belief upon vast amounts of scientific data. And the people who are skeptical of it feel that the data is insubstantial or uh, an error or that weather always fluctuates and that one should not take economic measures to obviate climate change when those economic measures would take money out of the pocketbooks of people in the business world uh, currently working. So we have a debate here that's a very uh, tense debate over climate now. When it comes to the 10 hundreds in the Middle East, uh, the issue of climate um, was uh, it, is similar, except there's a near total lack of hardcore scientific data. What you do find are changes occurring in the economy and the society. And it has been my conviction, as I worked more on this subject, that these changes were correlated as being consequences of, of climate change. And yet, 
At the same time, if you look strictly at uh, historical chronicles dealing with the Seljuk period, you find nothing but praise of the great Seljuks. And the praise is very, um, is very effusive. It's in, no one's ever had so much money. No one's ever had conquered so many lands. No one has ever uh, promoted uh, Muslim piety. Uh, these are wonderful, wonderful rulers. Uh, and I do not doubt that that seemed to be the case for the people of that time. And yet that tells you nothing about what seemed to be happening in the world of, say, an Iranian cotton merchant who's not buying and selling things at the court of the Sultan, but who is simply going about a commercial life that he has been engaged in for, uh, for two or three generations. You could make a very, very sound argument that the Seljuks are the, are the most important historical story of the 10 hundreds, and that everything hinges on, uh, on them and their preferences culturally, their preferences politically, their um, internal uh, struggles uh, with one another, and the involvement of Iranian administrators uh, with, uh, who are supposed to implement the policies that they prefer. But from my point of view, the other changes in the 10 hundreds uh, seem to be more important. More important, not because they deal with the same issues of politics and, and imperial grandeur, but more important because they are what lead to the emigration of Iranians into the surrounding lands and the appearance of Persian literature as one of the world's great uh, cultural um, efflorescences. Let's say if you were a patriotic Iranian today, you probably would look more to the greatness of later poets uh, than you would to the greatness of a Turkish sultan uh, in the 10 hundreds and, the, and his family. So this is not a trivial historical debate. When I published my book, it evoked a backlash very similar to what Robert Lopez encountered back in the, uh, in the 1950s. A backlash from people who, who saw the greatness of the Seljuks and the importance of the Seljuks, but also who saw the disruption that accompanied certain phases of Seljuk history. And I said, okay, the, the overall tendency is a great new ruling element appears and brings greatness, but when it fails, when it uh, falls into um, internal disorder, you get spin-off effects that affect uh, everyone in the society and bring down the prosperity of Iran of, the, uh, of that era, because nobody doubts that the, but that by the late 1100s, uh, Iran was in a state of, of substantial decline. The reasons why I think climate should be considered in this are, are several. And they tend either to be dismissed or uh, minimized or outright rejected by people who have disagreed with my interpretation of things. Well, let me give some examples. We know that the Seljuks were prosperous. They produced a very abundant uh, gold coinage in a land that wasn't known for its gold coinage. Iran, ever since the period of the pre-Islamic Shahs, had been a land primarily of silver coinage. And even up to the pretty much the day the Seljuks take o took over in Nishapur, uh, the dominant money form in Iran consisted of silver coins. And yet the country was very short on silver. So the coins were not of a very high quality. They were debased with other metals. But as long as it said dirham on the coin, uh, that was the nomination. The fact that the coin was devalued uh, in, uh, in metallic terms, I don't think should be stressed too much. After all, at one point you had a, say a $50 gold piece in America, 
And now you have a piece of paper that says $50 on it. But that $50 can buy you um, maybe not as much as the gold coin did. But what the denomination of the coin signifies in terms of its economic importance overrules the question of devaluation of metallic content. And in fact, it has been argued um, by uh, another economic historian, Carlo Cipolla, that in fact, devaluing coins was a way of spreading a small amount of silver over a much, much wider abundance of coinage. And that as the money supply grows, as you have more and more coins, even though the content of the coins is, is not very high in terms of precious metal, uh, the business that is, that is conducted and through the exchange of these coins, uh, this business can grow. You're increasing the money supply, you're increasing the amount of currency available in the overall uh, economy. And um, this can be a sign of economic health in the same way that today, um, many economists feel that we should always have one to 2% inflation in order to keep the money supply abundant for a growing economy. The Seljuks did not mint silver, or if they did, the quantity of Seljuk silver is extremely limited. Uh, hordes of coins have been found. Uh, there was one recently uh, published from the city of Ray as hundreds of Seljuk gold coins and no silver. I made a, a collection many years ago of all of the um, coins from Nishapur mint that I could identify. And among hundreds of examples of Seljuk gold coins, I found scarcely two or three examples of silver deer hands. The Seljuks had a glorious court. They, they bought nice things. They paid their army. But if you do everything with gold, what do you do for ordinary everyday transactions? You're taking away the abundance of money that is used to underwrite a prosperous and growing civilian economy. There may be reasons why gold was preferred of that and, and some way in which gold was handled in, in a fashion that did not have a bad effect on the civilian economy. But I don't see much evidence that that's the case. I think rather that the, the business economy uh, below the level of armies and courts and so forth, uh, I think it was starved for currency and that is associated with a shrinkage of the economy. A second example, the, I've talked about cotton and I've talked about how the, um, the Muslim population of Nishapur was drawn to the wearing of cotton cloth and also to the wearing of cotton cloth that would have a couple of inches of silk embroidery that would uh, mention Islam and the ruler and so forth in, in ceremonial garments. This kind of cloth is called tiraz. For the, in the Abbasid period, it was used extensively for uh, ornamenting garments given to rulers and uh, courtiers as gifts of honor. A gift, such a gift of honor would often be a plain piece of, of cotton or linen um, with the embroidered uh, rim, but it would be a contrast of, of white or plain color with the silk embroidery. The plain color that was most popular was white, that was associated with the Prophet Muhammad. Um, but you also had some striped cottons and you had uh, black uh, uh, cottons. I think that the contrast between white garments and the embroidered silk of the Iranian population who had not converted to Islam and who were keeping to the old ways of the uh, pre-Islamic era made for a very striking aesthetic contrast on the streets. You looked at someone and you knew that person's religion, or at least you knew which community 
the Muslim community or the non-Muslim Persian community, which community they wish to be identified with. And I think that, they, that this carried over into not only the clothing they wore, but into how they decorated their, their homes. Nishapur and Samarkand became famous for producing a type of, of pottery that looks like this. It's a plain white look with a virtually unreadable Arabic inscription. And it's a ceramic version of tiraz. It is white with calligraphy around it. And these plates were produced in the thousands. Many of them, probably most of them, didn't have any writing on them. This was not just for the, for the writing. But the writing is rather interesting, even though it's nearly illegible. There are certain things can be said about it. And I'm relying upon the work of a Ebal Kuchani who published a collection of translated uh, inscriptions. The writing is always in Arabic, not just Arabic uh, alphabet, but in the Arabic language. And yet it's doubtful that anyone who bought the item could actually read what it said, because it's extremely difficult even now for trained Arabists to decipher the, the inscriptions. And we're talking about people in the, in the 800s and 900s who uh, were, were buying these things. The content of the Arabic writing is interesting because it includes no, no quotations from the Quran. And it does not seem to include any of the hadith of the prophet. In other words, this is not sacred writing. <clears throat> it, it's more or less banal writing. It's things like blessings upon the owner, or honesty is a good policy, or uh, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything. Homilies, adages. One uh, scholar, Robert Hillenbrand, has likened them uh, to the sort to uh, fortune cookie uh, statements or uh, holiday poppers that they use in England. You don't know what it is until you open it up. Well, that's different. That's not what we have here because the customer could look and say, I want this one, but not that one. They, they saw it before they bought it. It was not popping out of the fortune cookie. And yet they probably couldn't, um, couldn't read it. I think that a closer uh, analogy is a souvenir t-shirt that has a writing on it where you can see, go down to lower Manhattan in New York and you can see shops that have you know, hundreds and hundreds of different t-shirts and you can put every one you want and you buy it. Okay, so some designs appeal to people. But I think that they didn't have religion because if these were used for food, they didn't want to put food on the words of the, of, well, the word of God or the words of the prophet. And yet they wanted it to, it was the sort of thing that they thought Muslim, had a Muslim look to it, just as the white garments they wore <clears throat> had a Muslim look to them. Now, as you get into the 10 hundreds, uh, these plates disappear. Uh, they're no longer made. They obviously phased out over time. We don't have an exact chronology. But also, when you look at the Seljuk imagery, you see that the silver embroidery on the edges of the tiraz has disappeared because tiraz now signifies not a plain cloth garment with a border of, uh, of silk embroidery, but rather a, a band of silk embroidery that is put uh, on the, uh, around the bicep of a tunic. And the tunic itself is made of silk, woven silk or embroidered silk. So the tastes of the old pre-Muslim period show up again. But that taste is, is interesting because one of the uh, hallmarks of the old pre-Islamic Iranian aristocracy was the enormous gulf between the rich who put a lot of money into buying beautiful silver plates and silver uh, objects that had imagery that uh, reflected the, the ethos of the uh, pre-Islamic aristocracy and the commoners who could not afford anything like that. What happened with the Muslims was that the old silver plates disappeared 
but the imagery of the pre-Islamic period continued on some pottery, not the type I just showed, but on uh, more figurative wear. So that if you were a, a Muslim, you might pick the pot that reflected the white garments, or you might pick a pot that had a picture of a horse rider or a hunter dressed in the old pre-Islamic style. In the Seljuk period, the old pre-Islamic style reappears as dominant uh, style among people in and around the court of the sultans. But those garments were much more expensive. In other words, silk weaving and uh, silk embroidery are, are much more um, costly uh, product. And this seems to coincide with the diminishing of cotton as a great export crop from Northern Iran. Geographers talk about what products are exported from, produced and exported from different areas. And the, the great centers of cotton growth in Northern Iran uh, fade out and do not reappear until later centuries. So something's going on with the, with the cotton economy. Something's going on with the distribution of money between the, the essentially the rich get richer if they are in the orbit of the court and ordinary people seem to get poorer and have less money and um, less luxurious amenities in their, in their lives. Uh, so we have uh, at the same time, completely new pottery styles. Here are two items that are characteristically Seljuk uh, from, uh, from Nishapur. This is a, uh, an oil lamp and it's made with a turquoise glaze. Even though turquoise is often thought of as specifically Muslim color, uh, these glazes were not known before the Seljuk period. And here is another example, a small Varello shaped container. The export of pottery may not be a terribly big deal, but it changes. You know, it, it, I think when the styles change, it's not simply a matter of, of a new color becoming popular. It's also a matter of, of, a new, of, of new styles of, of making pottery. The items I showed are sort of a humble sort of wear that anyone might acquire. But you also have coming to the fore immensely uh, elaborate and, and magnificent looking uh, tiles and uh, ornamented pots that clearly were meant for a very wealthy elite. And I think that what basically is happening is that the Northern Iranian cities had a sort of commercial Muslim bourgeoisie that is losing its financial clout. And yet those people who can be functioning in the orbit of the court are prospering and producing uh, highly, uh, highly uh, valued precious goods. And it's around this time in the Seljuk period that you begin to get um, people signing their works of art, making it even uh, more precious perhaps. Now, how does this tie in with, uh, with climate? Cotton is very sensitive to a growing season. If the climate gets chilled, it can impede the production of cotton. And yet, clearly, the hot summers of Iran did continue. So the effect, the impact on cotton probably would come in uh, planting crops too early in the spring before the soil temperature had risen sufficiently for the crop to, to germinate. Uh, cotton is very sensitive uh, in the uh, sprouting of the, of the seeds uh, to soil temperature. And of course, Iranian farmers had tradition to go by. Farmers often had a sort of uh, calendar in their heads as to when they plant and when they harvest and so on. Um, relating to seasonal indicators, but they did not have any way of testing the temperature of the soil. So maybe then they went through some, some bad years because of, uh, of a cooling of the climate. I think that they did. A final area that I paid attention to was the very fact of the movement of the Seljuk rulers and the Turkic speaking tribes that followed them, the moving these people into Iran. The Turks had been living 
or speakers of Turkic languages have been living uh, north of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan for a thousand years. We don't know a whole lot about them. That was not a particularly uh, literate society, but they were certainly up there. And yet when they had entered into the Islamic Middle East, they had tended to come in as individual uh, soldiers uh, or as slaves who were being sold to be trained as soldiers. It is striking that of the thousands of Muslim traveler scholars that we have notification about, none of them is identified as a Turk and Turk names do not show up. So they're not moving into the, into the civilian Muslim elite class that I've been uh, describing. What caused them to move south um, at that particular juncture in the early 10 hundreds? There is a, a consensus among historians that the reason for this had to do with political clashes in uh, Central Asia and that this was a, uh, a push factor that pushed Turkic tribes south. That consensus is based on a few scattered remarks in different chronicles. Could it have been some other reason? Since no one actually perceives climate change as it occurs, it's, it's difficult to, to be certain. But there is a, uh, to my degree, a strong likelihood that the movement of the Turks had to do with a cooling of the climate that was more sensitive the farther north you got. And this cooling of the climate threatened the livelihood of at least some of the, of the Turks. Threatened the livelihood, what does that mean? What is the livelihood of a nomadic ethnic group based on? As some of my critics have pointed out, most of the animals raised by uh, by the Turks were sheep and goats. Then they had horses that they rode and um, I suppose cows, but only a few percentage of, of their livestock were camels. And yet 100% of the livestock used for the caravan trade, the Silk Road, that went across from Northwest China, uh, across Northern Iran to Mesopotamia, 100% uh, of those animals were camels or close to 100%, you had some donkeys, I guess. And those camels were not being bred on some sort of camel farm run by a cotton merchant who wanted to sell his products. They were being acquired from the nomads who bred the camels. And that acquisition amounted to a, uh, basically an influx of cash money into the nomadic economy. Now, look, if, if you have nomads who are growing sheep, they can, uh, make things out of wool, they can eat the sheep, they can milk the sheep. Selling the sheep doesn't make much sense because they're off in the, away from the, uh, from, the commercial, from the population centers that, want, that would want to buy the meat. So they're not selling these sheep very much. But the horses, they might sell some horses, but actually they're raising the horses to ride them. And the question with, with nomads is how do they get cash money for those things that they need to buy. If you have pure nomads, Chinese uh, culture used to separate nomads into raw and cooked. And raw nomads were ones that, didn't, that did not buy tea or, other, or silk or, or Chinese goods. And the cooked nomads were the ones that, had, that were just as nomadic, but, but had some sort of commercial relationship with the Chinese populations uh, settled Chinese populations and urban Chinese populations that they came into contact with. That 3% of the, of the livestock that the nomad, the Turkic nomads have, have that were camels, I believe represented their primary source of cash money in their economy. They would either rent them or sell them to merchants. And just as importantly, they would uh, rent themselves as uh, camel pullers on the caravans. So even though the camels did not dominate the herds by any means, they were a crucial aspect of their economy. When the Turks moved south, they moved from the northern, from northern Turkmenistan to southern Turkmenistan. Same desert, Kar Karakum Desert. 
the northern side of the Karakum Desert is several hundred miles from the southern edge of the Karakum Desert. The desert was suitable for, for raising camels. And indeed, down to this day, um, Turkmenistan is a center for one hump camels. In the pre-Islamic period, it was a center for two hump camels. So there was a change in the livestock. But that change in the livestock is important because if you look at the, uh, at the geography of camel use in the world, uh, you find that the Turkmenistan was the most northerly edge of where two hump camels were in use. These were the, uh, the camels most exposed to, uh, to the winters of Central Asia. Two hump camels can operate throughout the, the winter, but the one hump camels were sensitive to cold. If you had a change of the, of the average weather, a chilling of the climate, it might make sense for certain Turkic groups to move into a slight, to a somewhat warmer environment where they are still in contact with the Silk Road and can sell the animals from which they gain uh, cash money. When you look at the places where the, that are identified as the spots where the Turks settled when they moved south, uh, they're right on the edge of the, of the desert, areas that are not uh, terribly desirable for farming. Once they moved south, there was no real blockage to them moving into farmlands. So a large part of the uh, disruption and destruction of the 10 hundreds and the 11 hundreds is attributed to nomadic raiders, pillagers. And undoubtedly that's, that's true. I mean, we certainly know that you had pillaging, we know that you had no respect for, for a flourishing urban economy if you could come in and destroy things or steal things. And yet, we also know that there is a tendency to, uh, to ascribe destruction to nomads just as a motif. In North Africa, in particular, Ibn Khaldun, the great historian, uh, talks about, and other historians, talk about how Arab tribes uh, in the 10 hundreds came from the east and destroyed everything. You know, if they, if they needed a tent peg, they would cut down an olive tree just to make a tent peg. I think that's not work for a tent peg, but, but it's that sort of exaggeration you got so that the notion arose in North African history that everything was flourishing until these Arab tribes came in and pillaged everything. And these stories of pillage, I think reflect an urban mentality that uh, was quite averse to, the, to accepting Turkic nomads as a normal part of their, of their environment. Certainly, tribes people would have had no particular respect for uh, sown lands. So much of the economic decline in terms of food supply and so forth can be ascribed to the nomads coming. And yet the nomads didn't stay. They moved on westward across northern Iran and eventually many of them ended up in northwestern Iran in mountainous country that was more suited to their horse herds. So while I think that a change in climate is constant with these moves, and to me explains the moves as a primary uh, item of causation, there is the problem of proving that. One of my critics has observed that, you know, it only got maybe two degrees Celsius colder. And, you know, anyone who's lived in the Midwest is prepared to go out if it's only four degrees Fahrenheit colder than it was uh, a year ago at that time. But keep in mind that in the climate debate today, two degrees Celsius as an average temperature change is considered to be somewhat destroys the world. The great effort of defending our future against uh, climate change focuses on trying to keep the, the increase increase in temperature below two degrees Celsius. So if it was only two degrees Celsius, and there is some support for that idea by other historians, uh, I'm happy with that, with that number. Now, I also should point out that I'm not the only person who has focused on climate. In particular, there is this book, The Collapse of the Eastern Mediterranean by uh, Ronnie Ellenbloom. The subtitle is Climate Change and the Decline of the East, 950 to 1072. 
Elm Bloom borrows the data that I use and the arguments I use and adds to it some more material that he's found and then weds that to what he sees as important elements of climate change in Syria and Egypt, which begins to get back to the, to the Claude Guyenne notion that there was something going on in the 10 hundreds uh, that may have, have been climate. Byzantine historians interested in the same period have taken note of climate as a significant issue in the Anatolian portion of the Byzantine Empire, uh, though not in, the, in Greece and the European lands. And there are other changes that occur at this time. Uh, Kiev in Russia goes into a period of collapse around this time, very possibly is related to, uh, to climate change. The migration of Armenians from Eastern Anatolia and classical historical Armenia to the Mediterranean coast of Southwestern Turkey, which becomes called Little Armenia. That seems to take place at this time as if they are fleeing some sort of, of a problem in their homeland. As indeed, I'll argue the, the Iranians come to flee problems in their homeland in this same, same time frame. So I don't know how this debate will, will evolve in coming years, obviously. In reading uh, Robert Lopez's uh, discussion of what happened when he said the Renaissance took place in the Depression and the, the opposition he, uh, he encountered, and then slowly people came around to, um, to supporting him and finding some credibility in his arguments. I would hope that in time, people would be able to look beyond the chronicles that uh, detail the grandeur of the Seljuk rulers, saying so and so is the greatest, the most powerful, the most pious, and so forth and so on. And thank you very much. I'll take pay for that uh, job I just did praising you. And they'll be able to look at uh, a multi-factor uh, profile of what's going on, but. Uh, whether a consensus eventually emerges about climate change and ultimately probably will depend upon uh, more abundant tree ring analyses uh, than I was able to find. But whether or not a consensus arises, I don't think there's any question but that the, the class of people that I have talked about in the last uh, two lectures before this that come into being and distinguish uh, Iran, the nine, the 800s and 900s from any other part of the Muslim world and show Iran to be a place of enormous innovation and dedication to Islamic knowledge and Islamic spirituality and Islamic uh, science. I think that that class of people shrinks. I don't think there's any question about that shrinkage. Although you do have some who will move into the orbit of the Sultan's court and do wonderful things. Omar Khayyam, for example, he does, a, uh, wonderful, uh, does wonderful things in mathematics and um, highly admired poetry, at least in, in modern era. Uh, and yet he was a tent maker. As I've mentioned before, I think he would, he, to the degree that he had anything to do with actual tent making, I think it's referring to pavilions, to the magnificent temporary dwellings used by the, uh, by the Seljuk rulers. And I think that the epithet tent maker actually intimates that he was in the orbit of the, of the ruling elite rather than simply another uh, dealer in cotton cloth. So you certainly have some Islamic scholars, scientists, philosophers, who live on into the into the 1100s, but the crisis is comes to a head in the late 10 hundreds, and I believe that crisis is climate related. In the scholarly world, we simply wait for new ideas to come along, and then see how people react to them, and if people decide that. I've overread my sources. That's fine. I did my best. And if people agree with me, um, as I hope they will come to do, I think that would help to explain 
a lot about Iranian history. But in any event, the migration of people out of Iran, regardless of its, uh, of its immediate causes, um, seems to have been well underway by the late 10 hundreds and throughout the 11 hundreds, a century before the Mongols uh, came to the Middle East. So that the broad vision of Middle East Islamic history that sees the Mongol conquests as a turning point and that ascribes every aspect of destruction and decline and disorder uh, to the horrible uh, experience of the Mongol conquest, I think that that has to be challenged and that we have to look at the immediate pre-Mongol period in a period of tremendous decline, disorder, and diasporic migration. This was just bad for Iran in some respects, but good for the world of literature because the Persian language becomes spread far and wide and the great monuments of Persian poetry uh, are largely in the subsequent uh, period. But I'll talk about that in my next book. Thank you.